Father in heaven, let your spirit be here with us today to hear these words and to hear the part that is for us. In Jesus' name, amen. So I want to start today with uh, kind of a uh, philosophical experiment. We are sometimes bombarded with the message that, uh, that, that really truth is relative and, and really in the context of the individual, it is your truth, and that all truths are essentially of equal value. Well, let, let's, let's go down that road. Let's see what we think about that. Um, whether all truths are really of equal value and really the most important thing is how strongly I believe it. So let's go down that road. Let's, and let's, let's do it with race. We, we talked a little bit about the different communities that are a part of this community. Let's go down that road. What if I had a strong belief that certain races are superior to others? And you would have to concede I would not be the first person in the world to have a belief like that. That certain races were better than others. And I even was able to come up with some sort of a convoluted biblical support for my view. I laid out my favorite text, and my argument was that, that this race was more important than another one. And I felt it strongly. Would that be okay, or would you be more likely to come to me and say, your wrong beliefs and your abuse of the Bible make you a danger. We could certainly look at history and find examples of it, right? we we'll just go to the Holocaust, right? Strong belief that this Aryan race was superior and that other races could be killed and it was not a problem. A lot of people had a strong belief. Did that make that belief on an equal level as one that said God has created all of the races? It doesn't, does it? Well, let's back it off a little bit. Let's say I'm not that extreme, that, that my view is that, okay, yeah, the races are probably all of equal value, but they should stay separate. Okay, we wouldn't have to go that far in history to come up where that was a prevalent attitude, where a lot of people held that belief very strongly. Now, for the record, the Adventist Church has never officially held the, held the position that the races should be separate. But we sure did by default, didn't we? Because we have a history of, of black churches and white churches. We kind of did it by default. And I think as we're in this day, we would, we would acknowledge we no longer believe those beliefs to be of equal value of the belief that God's message is for every kindred, nation, tongue, and people, and that God has called us to come back together around Jesus, not to separate. So if we have people or had people in the congregation who held on to that one belief, I think we would be right to say that is not our conviction of this time, and whether you feel like you have biblical support for that view or not, it's not a belief of equal value. It's pretty obvious when we put it in that context, isn't it? But it gets a little trickier when we start putting it in other contexts. So let's do that. Let's take a step beyond the issue of race. And let's put it in the context of religion. Are all belief systems of equal value. It's actually become popular in our day to say there are, there are many roads to the top of the mountain. But is that actually true? Or do we just want it to be true? Or, or maybe it feels good. It's the, it's the coexist bumper sticker idea. And I, I, I'm all in on getting along, absolutely. But I'm not all in on everything is of equal value in terms of truth. There's lots of religions in the world. There's Hindus, there's Buddhists, there's, there's Taoists, there's animists, there's Muslims, there's Jewish, there's Christian. Lots of definable groups. Does it matter what you believe or does it just matter that you're sincere? That's obviously not true in the context of race, right? 
you wouldn't want me to sincerely believe any of those things that I suggested. And I want to suggest to you that at least to the early disciples, they felt like truth mattered. Acts chapter 4, verse 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. That's pretty strong language, isn't it? It's a pretty strong call out. In fact, he's saying the stone you rejected has become the cornerstone. This is a pretty strong call out. He's saying Jesus matters and the truth about Jesus matters. The fact that he is the Christ, the Messiah, and the Son of God matters. And salvation is found in no other name. There aren't other roots up the mountain. Peter again in Acts chapter 2, this was actually earlier, on the day of Pentecost, and this adds another piece, because one of the things he says here, he's addressing specifically this Jewish group. But but let's take it a step further. Acts chapter two, verse 36. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, repent, And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Now, let's just break this down a little bit. He says, repent and be baptized. These are actions that follow belief. Repent of wrong belief, embrace new belief, Participate in belief by being baptized. Receive forgiveness of sin through Jesus Christ. Receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. These are the promises of belief. And he says the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Now, when Peter made that statement, I'm not sure he understood just how true that statement was in the larger sense then maybe he realized it. In the moment, he may have been thinking all of Israel in a literal sense. But Peter himself would be key to the process that would later bring about another level of belief and understanding that the work of Jesus and salvation was not limited just to the Jews, but was for the Gentiles as well. Reminds me a little bit of the language that we've been hearing from the message of the first angel in Revelation chapter 14. Do you remember these words? Revelation 14, verse 6. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth. We've talked about everlasting gospel. This is the story of the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus and what it means. And that we become Christian on the day that we believe that Jesus is the Messiah the Son of God and the Savior. That's what makes a Christian. So the angel flies, having this message about Jesus to preach unto them that dwell on the earth. Which ones? And to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. So here's the question. If truth doesn't matter, then why is this angel sent to send the message of Jesus to everyone on earth? You see, if truth and belief don't matter, then evangelism really has no basis, does it? You're just irritating people for no reason. But if it does matter, and that it's a little more than just whether or not you're sincere, That has implications for us, doesn't it? There is such thing as being sincerely wrong. 
The Apostle Paul, back in the days when he was Saul, was very sincere about persecuting the people of the way. They weren't really Christians yet. They weren't called that yet anyway. Because they were polluting Judaism. He was sincere. But later he would confess, I was sincerely wrong. And he would become the great evangelist for the Christian faith. So I posed the question at the beginning, are all beliefs of equal value and the only thing that matters is how sincere we are? Now I think sincerity matters and I think God is gracious and I think he has his means of dealing with the reality of the world, particularly the parts of the world that have not heard the message of Jesus because we've not been faithful in our charge. And I believe by his sovereign grace, he will save who he believes can and should be saved. However, that does not remove the mandate and the reality and the truth that salvation is through Jesus alone. Truth matters. But now that I've established that point, and to say that, truth matters is a saying that preordains strife, doesn't it? Because to say that truth matters means that falsehood and truth will result in strife. And it raises the great question posed by Pontius Pilate, what is truth? We're talking about the second angel. This is the third week we've been talking about the message of the second angel. Revelation 14, verse 8, and I've suggested to you that the second angel comes to announce the failure of man. And what I mean by that is that the schemes of man fail. Every attempt by humans to order the chaotic world and control the chaotic world outside of God ultimately results in failure. Revelation 14, verse 8, And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So we spent time last Sabbath talking about this second angel, going through the history of the Old Testament and the history of God's people. So one of the points I made on the first Sabbath was, was those efforts of the people who do not associate themselves with God ultimately fail. And that was the example of Babylon. That's what the angel says. The great nation of Babylon, surely this will last forever. But within three generations, it's collapsed. All of the great works of godless humanity will fail. But then last Sabbath, I made it a little more uncomfortable. And we went through Old Testament history. And we talked about the pattern that continues to emerge, that God calls a people, and they are God's people. And those people go out and set on the course that God has set them on, but then they inevitably fail in what God has called them to do. Yet through them, God still succeeds and still wins his victory. So we walk through Old Testament history and we saw how that happens again and again. The people are called and they respond and, and they fail, but yet God's purpose is still sustained. And the other thing is they don't stop being God's people just because they fail. God still does his work through them and he still achieves his purpose until ultimately it all comes down to the life of Jesus who was born. And he lives for all humanity, the victorious life of faithfulness to God. And he dies for the sins of all and by his resurrection establishes the kingdom of God. Now that was the story up to Jesus. Now what do you think after that? Has the model changed since the time of Jesus? Well, let's let's walk down this road and see, see what history tells us. And we'll start in the New Testament with Christian history. We talked a little bit about Peter and how he made that statement that this message will be for all. Peter himself would get himself into a bit of trouble for something he would do, and it would go like this. He would see a vision from God that says, don't call anything unclean that I've made clean. And as he pondered that, at the door would be some men saying, our our master Cornelius has sent us to you. He was a Roman centurion. 
he says, you have some things to tell us. Will you please come tell us? And Peter will travel to the city of Cornelius and he will come and he will enter the home of Cornelius and be very uncomfortable doing it because traditionally he's not supposed to do that. And he will even comment on that. But he'll say, God has showed me that I am to call no man unclean. But because even Peter himself is not ready to understand everything that God intends to do, he preaches to them. Now, typically what happens with Jews and Samaritans so far, Peter will preach to them, they will believe, they will be baptized, and then the Holy Spirit will come on them. That's been the pattern. But something different happens this time because God knows Peter's not going to baptize a Gentile. The Holy Spirit falls on the Gentiles before they're even baptized. And it blows Peter's mind. He steps back and he says, what has just happened here? And he says to the others with him, what's to keep us from baptizing these people? They've already received the gift of the Spirit. And so he takes them and he baptizes them and it gets him in trouble. And he goes back to Jerusalem and they say, what are you doing, man? What are you doing? They're not even circumcised. And Peter's like, I know. I didn't think this could happen either. But it kind of looks like maybe the Gentiles are invited into this thing. Aren't you glad the Gentiles are invited into this thing? Because that's what most of us are. Aren't you glad we got invited in? And Peter's beginning to realize, wow, this is bigger than I knew. My belief was not big enough. The grace of Jesus is for everyone. But this new truth caused some strife. There's a book in the Bible by the title Galatians. It's a book written by Paul to people who live in a certain region of of Asia Minor, the country of Turkey today, a certain region there where Paul had gone and taught these Gentiles the gospel. And some people had come from Jerusalem some purifiers, and they'd come behind Paul and they'd said to the people there, yes, what Paul told you is true, but he didn't tell you everything. You're going to also need to be circumcised. You're going to need to follow these parts of the Jewish law. You're going to need to do all of these things. And Paul writes this letter saying, that's not the gospel. That's not right. There was strife. There was disagreement over truth. Ultimately, this conflict would build up, and you can find in Acts chapter 15 the attempt of the early church to resolve this conflict. They held a council. They called everyone together. They got together and they talked about, and they concluded at the end of this council that yes, in fact, the Gentiles don't have to be circumcised. They can be a part of the community of believers. There were just four things they gave them that they needed to make sure the Gentiles were conscious of. And they went out and proclaimed this everywhere. But here's the interesting thing about that council. You might be inclined to think that those four things were pretty much set in stone from then on. But one of the things they mentioned was not eating food sacrificed to idols. Now, that's not really an issue in our day. Um, But it was in those days. But later on, Paul will write to the Gentiles. We all know that that's not that big a deal. But for the sake of conscience, don't violate it. So even that, even that in of itself, there was a dispute about what exactly truth was. Now, what happened to the church after that? And this is a fascinating history. Because sometimes we've had a tendency to talk really bad about what became of the church. But I want to suggest to you that the course that the church went down led it to an inevitable trap. And we can be subject to that same trap as well. And here's how it happened. So so Paul wrote to Titus and he said, in the cities appoint overseers, or you could use the word bishop, appoint spiritual leaders over the house churches in the towns to help the people's doctrine stay pure and to help resolve conflict in the town. And that worked pretty well for a while until it got to the point where some of the the, the overseer of this town disagreed with the overseer of this town. So the church, in an effort to maintain unity, in an effort to maintain some semblance of doctrinal purity, established archbishops, which were overseers of bishops over a larger area. And their job was to help resolve the crisis between the bishops in the areas. 
But then sometimes they didn't agree. So then there developed centers of of leadership significance. So the church in Antioch was one, the church in Alexandria was one, the church in Ephesus was one, the church in Rome developed as one. And these kind of became regional places to get your arguments resolved. And that was all good except for the fact that the church in Antioch and the church in Alexandria could never agree on anything. You think we invented strife. No, it's it's been going on. So they started having councils large councils and these councils got together and many of the things they did were really good for example the the synod of hippo in the year 393 the reason we have a bible is largely due to the council that met at the synod of hippo in the year 393 where they went through the all of these different writings and said we think these are the ones that best reflect the message that god would have passed on That's a little crazy to think about, isn't it? A group of believers got together in a room and looked at all the possible books and said, yeah, I think these are the ones, and that's what we call the Bible. Aren't you glad we don't have to do that? Can you imagine how much going around we would do on something like that? And we would be inclined to think, well, the Synod of Hippo must have been a very special one, and God must have really been present because he he, he had them choose the right books for the Bible and that passed through. Rather than saying it was a special one, I think it's a perfect example of what I'm saying, that despite human error and failing, God still manages to achieve his purpose. They established the Bible, but you know what else they established at that particular meeting? It was called apostolic succession. What it meant was you can't actually be a leader in the church unless you can trace your ordination all the way back to one of the 12 apostles. Yeah, we don't really do that anymore. So they had these councils, and the problem was then, if you didn't like something that one council decided, you you got another council going. Now, they were dealing with real problems. In the early church, there were people saying Jesus didn't come in the flesh. There were other people that saying Jesus didn't really die on the cross. There were all of these different views. There were arguments about whether Jesus was God or not. All of these things were argued in this time and worked out through this process, but the church was constantly being being disrupted by heretics and heresies. And so the church tried everything it could to defend the flock from the wolves. And finally it reached a point where we're just tearing ourselves apart. Let's let's choose someone that we know is a really righteous person and talks with God, and let's make them the top person. Do you see how the church got where it got? The authoritarian struggle, the the battle over heresy and how to keep it from destroying the church. The councils, I think, mostly failed, but they did succeed in the most important points. They gave us the core doctrines of the faith and they gave us the Bible. But ultimately, the process itself locked itself up into a hierarchy system of church governance. And that held together until the great Tower of Babel moment of Christianity, also known as the Protestant Reformation. You see, the church had become united, but it was united to its own destruction. And the reformers came along and said, I don't think what we believe lines up with what the Bible says anymore. And Martin Luther came along and he said, I think it's Bible only and grace only and faith only. He didn't mean to break the church apart, but it happened. And Zwingli and Calvin and the other reformers came along, and the church didn't just break into two groups, it shattered. Just like at the Tower of Babel when God confused the languages and the people went all over the earth. In the same way, the Christian church shattered into little pieces. And as much as we hate the fact that there's those divisions out there, yet at the same time, I can't help but think God did this on purpose to save us. Because when we unite, we tend to unite to our destruction. So he broke us apart so that the important truths could find their way back. Now, he does intend to bring us back. 
But he had to do this to save us. So Protestantism brought back sola scriptura, sola gratia, sola fide, the Bible only, grace only, faith only. Yet Martin Luther, who so beautifully talked about these things, himself, he was not a perfect man. He hated Jews. So much so that some of his writings were actually quoted by Nazis. It's not good when you're quoted by Nazis. There's a lot of failure in Christian history. And since that time, there have been, there have been times of ups and times of downs. There have been short-term wins followed by failings in the church again and again and again. Jerry Falwell Jr. is just the latest example of the cycle. The pattern has been consistent. God is ever calling his people. His people hear his call and succeed for a season. But eventually, failure makes us the problem, not the answer. Yet God is still not defeated. His victory is never threatened by our failing. And he calls again, and another group comes and responds and has their season of faithfulness. But the problem with even what we do with religion is over time it becomes about us and not about Jesus. Revelation 14, verse 8, And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So so as we transition towards closing this, here's, here's what I want to say. Much of what is called Christianity today is contributing as much to the problem as it is pointing to the solution. We're caught in our own traps. The great danger of the church in every era is to conclude that we, the church, are what matters, not Jesus is what matters. And in order to be helpful, we define ourselves as the solution instead of pointing to Him as the solution. And this is Babylon. This is the attempt by humanity to control or order the world without God. And even the church is subject to it. It's an easy trap. We fall into it. Truth matters, right? We agreed on that. Truth matters. Heretics arise and do damage. We agree that's true. We must control those heretics and hold the flock together. Yes, these are all good things. But at what cost? Persecution? Inquisition? The other route is to just try to play nice with everybody. But that's kind of like going back to Israel's history where they kept falling into idolatry. They kept losing the most important things. The other option is to make really strict rules. But that's kind of the history that leads to Phariseeism, right? So Seventh-day Adventists are a people who care about truth. And we have focused on that. And I will have some comments about us in a minute. But we have long resisted some of the efforts that have been defined as what's called ecumenism, the, the, the desire to bring the churches closer together in fellowship. We've kind of been outliers on that, although we've kind of dropped our guard on that a bit over the last few years. And some of that's good, but some of that hasn't been so good for us. Because in the process, we've ingested quite a few things that aren't really true and in lost touch with some things that are. Now, I want to talk for just a couple minutes here at the end about churches and different identifiable churches. There are are names that go with different groups. And I'm not saying anything negative about individuals and the sincerity of individuals, but I do point you back to the beginning that sincerity is not always enough. It's important to believe what is true. We'll start with just a few words about the Catholic Church because it's the one that we all came from ultimately. It was what developed through the years. And here's what I would say. Time has not been a friend to the Catholic Church. And the reason I say it that way is sometimes I wonder what Adventism would become given enough time. 
Time has not been a friend, and neither has the era when the church was able to be a major political player on the world stage. There were times, you see, the church redefined salvation in a way that said, you get your salvation through us. So you come to us and we'll talk to God for you, and if we think it's okay, you can be forgiven. But if you really mess up, we're gonna excommunicate you or put your land on interdict and all your people are lost until we say they're not. That's power, right? But that's not healthy for the church. And that era was not healthy and it produced a mentality that says the church is it and God only works through us. And ultimately the church would end up usurping the role of Jesus because you don't confess to the church, you confess to the Lord. It's not healthy, it's not good. And this interposition led to the veneration of humans, failing humans, called saints. And particularly a very bizarre fixation on Jesus' mother. Now I'm sure these were really good people. But we don't pray to really good people. We pray to the Father in the name of Jesus. And that's a truth, and it's one that matters. But I would also say a word to the conservative fundamentalists of our day. They're really good at preserving the faithfulness of the past. They grab onto the orthodoxy and hang on to it, but they're not always good at actually looking at what the orthodoxy says. For example, many fervent people are not meeting today. They'll be meeting tomorrow. Now, there's nothing wrong with worshiping God on any day of the week. I'm not going to denigrate that. But I am going to say this. There's only one day that's the Sabbath. And it's the seventh day. Now, there aren't so many people out there anymore trying to claim Sunday as Sabbath. They actually used to do that. That was done a lot in the past. But the only authority you have for that is that a human said Sunday is now Sabbath because the Bible only says the seventh day is Sabbath. And I'm not going to knock you for worshiping God on any day of the week, but I am going to ask you why don't you do it on the Sabbath, the day that God appointed for all time for worship. And there's another thing that's rampant in very strongly held in conservative fundamentalism, and that's the idea of the immortal soul. The notion of the immortal soul has even crept in some ways into Adventist community, kind of by default thinking, because society at large just likes to imagine anyone that died is in heaven. But the problem with that is it's a fundamental belief of the first lie ever told in the Garden of Eden, when the serpent said to Eve, You will not surely die if you disobey God. And since that time, our insecurity about our ability to outlive our physical reality has caused us to demonstrate a lack of faith in God's ability to create and recreate and demanded we have inside of ourselves some sort of immortal seed that will go on even though I die, even though the construct of creation is simple. Out of the earth he formed the body, he breathed the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And at death, the body goes back to what it was, the breath goes back to God, and man becomes a not living soul. He's not alive anymore. It's not there. But yet so many have hung on to this thing and it has created a most God reputation marring reality. And here's how it goes. It's all good for the good souls, right? Because you go to heaven and you're with God forever. Even though that's fundamentally against the purpose of creation, which was the earth, not heaven, but for another day on that. So the good souls are fine, but now you have a problem. What about all those people that didn't live good? Now you're stuck with eternal souls that are bad. And you end up with a place for them called hell. And what you come up with is a God 
who on the basis of 70 years of marginal living will, confer, will consign you to an eternity of suffering. Now let me ask you this. We would all agree, we, we've talked about the Holocaust a couple times today, we would all agree that those who were responsible for that did some very incredibly evil things and were worthy of punishment. But if someone had decreed a sentence on one of them, that you will spend the next 30 years suffering every minute and every moment, we would have said, you're too cruel. You cannot do that. Yet we're going to worship a God that would torment for eternity? See, this is, this is not good. This is what happens when we don't believe truth. And the other thing about conservative fundamentalism is in this notion somehow that God is, that, that America is Israel and, and God's favorite people on the earth, there is this desperate need to try to legislate their view of morality on the rest of the world. But government and religion don't mix well. And if we want transformation amongst the American people, it's got to come from the heart not from the law. Mainline Protestantism. I love mainline Protestants. They're really good people. They're really kind. They want the good of the world. They care about things. The problem is, I'm not sure they actually believe anything anymore. A lot of them have become very gracious unbelievers and are basically living in denial of all the points that the first angel comes to make. He comes to proclaim the everlasting gospel. That's the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Well, a lot of them are pretty sure Jesus lived. A lot of them are pretty sure he died, but don't know about resurrection, and virgin birth seems a stretch. And the idea of God as creator, that's not very popular anymore, even in Christian circles. And the idea of a judgment doesn't really seem good. And whether or not we can trust the Bible, I don't know. So you've got this whole group of people, I think the best description I've ever heard, is both feet firmly planted in the air. There's, there's nothing there. It's just a lot of good intention. And I'm glad. I want people to do good. But it's got to be based on something solid. They're the people of God who aren't sure God is who He says He is. Well, last of all, I want to talk about the Seventh-day Adventists. You see, we're not immune from this. We've been living in a reality of what I would call creeping authoritarianism for quite a while. And how does it happen? Well, it happens because we care about truth. And there's people who come along who challenge that truth. And, and things start coming in from the outside. And we say, we've got to defend this. We've got to protect this. We've got to set up so that we know what truth is. So, so you know what we do? We, we violate, in our desire to do good, we violate one of the deepest principles of our founders. Our founders said we have no creed from, but the Bible. But we say, yeah, but, but, but here's what the Bible says. And we write out a creed. And then we start to judge people based on the creed. And over time, that process is what leads to persecution. See how that goes? The, the reason it's a trap is if we don't do something, then the crazy people tear the church apart. So we try to defend it. And what's the right authority to defend it? We've always been prone to legalism. That's always been a thing for us because we respect the law. So we've always been a little prone to legalism, but we've kind of broken out of that over the last few years, but unfortunately in that time, a lot of other things have kind of crept in, and this has resulted in a unity struggle from the, from the more legal-minded and the more, well, graciously called open-minded, I guess. Um, there's been strife, and, and, and our leaders are trying to hold this church together and trying to define what is truth. And so you know what we've come up with, with to try to determine what is truth? Just to prove there's nothing new under the sun? A council. That's not new, is it? Church has been doing that for a long time. We try to hold it together. Now, I think in our community there's been a little pause in the stress that we've been feeling for a time. 
But we've been on a road towards authoritarianism for quite a while, and it's dangerous for us. There followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen that great city because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The trap is that in the end, everybody has to believe what I believe. And if you don't, I will persecute you. But here's the answer. Revelation chapter 3, verse 18. This is the letter to the Laodicean church. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich. So in order to refine gold, it's got to go through a process. Okay? You've got to get that gold, and the way you get that gold is you go to the Bible yourself and you pray and you have that personal relationship with Jesus. And you've got to work for it. You can't just come here and trust everything I tell you. You've got to work for this. The worst possible outcome would be everyone would believe exactly the way I do because I'm not right on everything. I'm just not sure where I'm wrong. so you can become rich, and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness. How you live matters. Don't claim the name of Jesus and then go out and embarrass him. It matters. And salve to put on your eyes so you can see. If you didn't know, and I think you do, the world is full of those who would deceive you. Now, you don't have to walk around paranoid because even the paranoid ones are deceived. But you do need to be able to see clearly, and that's the eyes of the Holy Spirit. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. We don't want faith to have rebuke and discipline in it. Just encouragement, right? No, that's enabling. That's a different thing. God is not the great enabler. He does enable us to do things, but he also rebukes and disciplines. So be earnest and repent. Receiving grace is easy. Living a Christian life can be a challenge. Be earnest. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne just as I was victorious and sat down with my Father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. We can be victorious. Jesus will see us through. We can have eyes that see. We can have ears that hear. We don't have to fall in the traps. Babylon has fallen and the schemes of man fail, but the kingdom of God remains. So I take you back to Micah 6 8. This is how we need to live do justly, love mercy, walk humbly. If we will follow that formula, We will be faithful. And hang on to these beliefs. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Let that be at the core. That's the heart of God's victory. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Hang on to that. It's what gives meaning to the story. If I go, I will come again, Jesus said. Hang on to that. That's the hope of the restoration. To do this, will require patient endurance. Or maybe another word you've heard me say, hupomone. We're going to talk about that in a couple weeks when we get to the third angel. But we've got to trust in the victory of God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, the things we build fail, but your will is still done. We as a people don't want to put our confidence in ourselves. We want to put our confidence in Jesus and in his ability to lead us by the Holy Spirit. That's where we're going to look. You see us just as we are. Receive us, Lord. Transform us. We want to be your faithful people. In Jesus' name, amen.